Right. Well, welcome to another episode of the uh, Scriptural Mormonism podcast. I'm your host, Robert Boylan. Today, we have uh, a returning guest, uh, Blake Osler. Blake was actually the very first guest on the podcast. Uh, he kindly agreed to come on a few months ago to discuss a topic we're both fond of discussing, open theism and issues related there too. And that was a pretty fun discussion. And Blake has come on now to discuss um, his interpretation of both the King Fuller Discourse and the Sermon and Grove and Joseph Smith's theology of God, Father and related issues. Uh, before we delve into this, uh, Blake, uh, thanks for agreeing to come on again. It's uh, really appreciated. Uh, I'm honored, and, and I'm glad to be able to spend some time with you noodling through these ideas. <laughs> um, I'm sure, like, people who follow my blog, follow this podcast, know who you are, but, like, uh, maybe if you, and you've already given, like, a, uh, an introduction to yourself in episode one, but, like, uh, for those who may be new to uh, this or never heard of you before, uh, maybe if you were to give, like, a um, summary of your background, interests, and what got you interested in topic we'll be discussing today as well. Sure. I, uh, I'm actually a practicing attorney. I've been practicing for 38 years with specialties in uh, commercial litigation, constitutional litigation, and um, all types of employment law issues. Um, I received my Juris Doctorate from the University of Utah in 1985, joint degree in jurisprudence and philosophy. And I have taught um, at a number of universities. I taught at BYU as an adjunct um, teacher at, um, for about eight years, um, teaching philosophy classes at the Salt Lake Satellite, and also taught classes on campus down at BYU. These were usually advanced philosophy of religion classes. So, and I co-taught those generally with, with David Polson, who passed a few years ago, and I miss him greatly. <laughs> I'm the I'm married to an amazing woman, Christine um, Edwards Osler. I have five children and fourteen grandchildren, and that's probably the most important thing of all. <laughs> and of course, you've written a number of books and articles. Uh, for instance, um, my first introduction to you was Volume One of the Four Volume Now Exploring Mormon Taught series, as well as your 1987 article, uh, The Book of Mormon is a Modern Expansion of a Nation Source, uh, which was very top provoking and. Uh, for the most part, I still think holds up for, uh, very much today, especially the um, ancient Near Eastern stuff uh, critics o often overlook. But um, I haven't changed my view on that um, at all. Um, yeah. it, with one exception, I argued that um, Anselm's satisfaction theory was found in, in Alma's view of the atonement, and I've changed my view it isn't. <laughs> Uh, we all make mistakes sometimes. Uh, the joke is like, I'm not infallible. Once I thought I was in error about something, but upon closer inspection, it turned out I was right. But, um, <laughs> if you want to know how infallible I am, just ask my wife. She'll put me in my place fast. So, <laughs> okay. well, uh, today we will be discussing, uh, as I said, the Kinfall of Discourse, the Sermon and Grove, and Joseph Smith's theology of God the Father, and of course, related issues there too. Um, in 2006, volume two of your book, Exploring More and Todd. The problems of theism, the love of God, which dealt primarily with soteriology, the theology of salvation, had a final chapter, chapter 12, God, the eternal father. And by the way, everyone should get all four volumes of the set, as well as the problem, um, uh, as well as Blake's other books and um, check them out as well. They're very good. Um, but in that you proposed, although it's not necessarily novel to you, like some other people have proposed a similar reading here and there, you did have like one of the most sustained interpretations and readings of the King Follow Discourse and Sermon of the Grove arguing for um, a kinship monotheistic reading, if you will, of the King Fuller Discourse and Sermon in the Grove. So uh, if you were to give maybe like a summary of like, say, what the traditional LDS readings of those sermons are, and your proposed reading of the uh, sermon, and where they differ. So I think the traditional reading is that there was an eternity before which God became divine. And he grew line upon line and grace to grace until he mastered the laws of the universe, learned how to, to um, um, basically technologically um, control the universe and became God. Also by following the, the moral laws that had been laid down by the gods that came before him, there's an eternal regress of gods. He then became mortal and after his mortality was resurrected and became exalted and for the first moment in eternity became divine. I think that's the standard reading. Um, if I haven't done it justice, I'm, I'm open to being corrected, but that's, that's how I understand folks grasp that. Yeah, that, no, that's, that's a very good, albeit uh, brief summary of the traditional reading I come across as well. 
Right. Um, the view that I argue for, because I believe that that, that interpretation is, is based upon a, a misunderstanding of the text entirely and a number of assumptions that are brought to the text, is that God, um, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost have been God from all eternity. However, God, God hasn't been God from all eternity only in the sense that at one point in time, God the Father became mortal just as the Son became mortal and just as the Holy Ghost will one day become mortal. Joseph Smith taught all of those things. And then God the Father, like God the Son, when he became mortal, had the power within himself to resurrect and um, was exalted even further after his, his mortal um, experience and is now um, guiding us to become fully divine. Full divinity, I'm going to distinguish between full and I guess we could call it mere divinity. Full divinity is to be in a loving relationship of unity with the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, by which their light, power, knowledge, and intelligence interpenetrate us um, totally and therefore deify us in every sense that they're divine. Okay, this is critical because people misunderstand my view, and I want to correct this. People understand me to be saying that humans are of a different order ontologically, that means in their very mode of being, than the divine persons who have been divine from all eternity. That's not the case. Um, what makes us divine is to be in this loving unity. And in each moment of eternity where the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost could choose to be in this unity by loving each other, they've made that choice. We haven't made that choice. And the difference is a choice. It's not an ontological distinction, okay? God and, and the Son and the Holy Ghost continue to grow from one grace to another, from one exaltation to another in a course of eternal progression. They have invited us into this relationship, and through it, we can become fully divine in every sense that they are and join them in the process of eternal progression fully. Um, and so that's, that's the distinction in the reading. Um, I, I, I hope that's adequate. <laughs> Oh, you're you're muted. No, that's a very good summary of um, chapter 12 of your book. And by the way, for those listening in the show notes, I'll include a link to the Exploring Mormon Todd podcast, where Blake and one of his sons discusses this particular uh, reading of the Kinfold Discourse in Sermon on the Grove, as well as a recent interview Blake uh, did with two of my friends, Hayden Curl and Jacob Hansen, on the Toddville Fate podcast as well, where a lot of the common objections and misunderstandings were brought out. Uh, and maybe we can go through like some of the... Um, evidences pre kinfold discourse like joseph's understanding of god the father uh later right. in the podcast but we, um, we do that yeah and, and and let me point out that i also address this in the first chapter of volume three i have an entire section where i i give succinct arguments as to why the textual reading that i give is the best reading of the text available to us yeah and that's uh of god and gods from 2008 uh, a very good book on the uh, number of god uh, by the way i really enjoyed it um but um, one of the reasons why we're actually having this podcast is um, dialogue, and um, I don't know about you, but like until a few years ago, I thought dialogue was actually a pretty good journal. They used to publish very good material, but in recent years, um, largely because of a certain editor they have at the moment, I'm not sure if we should name names, but um, um, the author of a pretty atrocious book, that's a very good clue. Um, uh, dialogue in a recent issue had a uh, critique from an evangelical Protestant, uh, a Lauren Pankratz, quote, uh, was Joseph Smith a mono theist an engagement with Blake Oster's theological position on nature of God? And that's volume uh, 55, number 2, summer 2022, uh, pages 37 to 55, uh, for those who want to uh, actually read the article. Um, now, I don't know about you, Blake, but when I was going through the article, I thought it was pretty hit and miss and literally miss, but I thought it would be a good idea because many of these arguments are arguments I find, even amongst my fellow Latter-day Saints, um, who may agree with the traditional reading at times. Not that I'm trying to impute to them, like, say, any anti-LDS uh, sentiment here, like, um, but this article was pretty atrocious, but it did bring up, like, a number of um, attempted criticisms of your position, and I thought it would be good to actually get you to, like, maybe address these because dialogue does actually have a wide... Um, it's widely read amongst like many LDS, um, not just critics of the church, and I thought it would be a good idea, like maybe to address and clarify your positions because it seemed at times Pankratz uh, did not really do justice to your reading. 
and sometimes he engaged in a lot of uh, fallacious arguments as well. So I'm not sure if you have any uh, preliminary comments about the article before you... Uh, you yeah, I mean, let's, let's get clear on who Warren Pankratz is. He puts out such works as Saving the Mormons with the Bible. Um, you know, he, he publishes essentially evangelical fundamentalist critiques of Mormons and you know, usually I, I grant to people um, an assumption of good faith and that they're operating in good faith. Um, I'm willing to grant that to Pankratz to an extent, but I'll let the evidence speak for itself because I think it suggests that we're not dealing with somebody who's dealing with the evidence in an even-handed way. Yeah, when I was reading the article, I decided to find out who he was, and it turns out he's friends with Aaron Shapoholoff and a few others who I have no, absolutely no respect for, and I'll happily say that here. Um, to be fair, maybe Pankratz was when he fed, like, say, um, some pages in photocopied form of your uh, book, and uh, that's as far as it went, giving him, like, any uh, semblance of uh, credibility. But Well, he would have also had to have been missing all of the various accounts of yeah. the King that discourse in order to mangle the evidence as badly as he did and to hide what was critical the way he did. And yeah, which is, which is why I don't believe he's an honest actor, but I'm just saying, yeah. like, if you want to throw the dog blood... So but, um, I believe you uh, have a presentation ready. So I'm not sure if you want to go to yeah, that first. So, or... No, I'll, let, let me. So Pankratz basically argues that. So one of the major arguments I have is that what Joseph Smith is doing in the King Philip discourse is parsing the very first word of the Bible. OK, it, it, it's what he he begins his discussion of who God is by pointing out that he's that we're in God's form like Adam. And there are two very critical points that I want to make. One is that he completely avoids the actual discussion that Joseph Smith does of the head God, showing that he is the God of all other gods, which is exactly the statement in DNC 121. And so I, I just want to jump into that and show every... Now, there are various counts of the King Philip discourse given April 7, 1844. And... We have accounts by Thomas Bullock, who was the official stenographer, Wilford Woodruff, William Clayton. We have a number of um, a McIntyre notebook. So there were a number of people who took down what was being said in the King Follett discourse. And the big problem that Pankratz has is he doesn't understand at all. Either he, A, doesn't understand at all what Joseph Smith was asserting, or I, su I suggest it's more likely what he was doing was avoiding the actual evidence so that he could get a particular reading. So Joseph Smith begins by, by um, parsing the very first word of the Bible, Bereshit, okay? And in parsing it, he makes the argument that the bat wasn't originally there, okay? The very first letter in the Hebrew Bible was put there by... A, re, a Jewish redactor who had no authority to put it there. And what that left was, was the word Rosh or Rashid. And so what we get from Joseph Smith, and this is, I'm just going to read. So this is from the Thomas Bullock report. And I'm going to read through these, these first, all of these accounts. So you can see they're totally consistent. He's always doing the same thing, and that I'm going to prove that Pan Pankratz has no clue what he's dealing with here. He doesn't even discuss Joseph Smith's parsing of the word Rosh in Hebrew. He avoids it entirely. He does make one quote, but he doesn't even address it in his entire article. I shall go to the first word in the Bible, and I'm, I'm reading from, from notes here. Um, the, the first, in the beginning, Bereshet in, by, through, and everything else. So what he's saying is, is the word Bereshit actually means in, by, or through. It doesn't mean in the beginning, I think is, is his point here. Um, Roshed, the head, when the inspired man wrote it, it did not, he did not put the first point to it. A man, a Jew, without any authority, thought it too bad to begin to talk about the head of many, of any man. And then this is the quote, the head one of the gods brought forth the gods. I'm gonna show that in every single account, this is exactly what Joseph Smith did. It's his translation of the word Rosh. The head one of the gods brought forth the gods is the meaning of the word. 
that is that God brought forth the gods in the head council. The head God called forth the gods and sat in grand council. So what God is doing, Joseph Smith interprets this to say that Rosh means that the head God is bringing forth the gods. That's his translation. It's consistent through every single um, no, this is Wilfred Woodruff. This can be found on page 345 of the words of Joseph Smith that gives the originals of each of, uh, of this discourse. I will go to the Bible, better sheet. He doesn't translate it or transliterate it correctly, but in the beginning, analyze the word in and through the head. An old Jew added the word bath. It read the head, one of the gods brought forth the gods. The grand council sat at the head and contemplated the creation of the world. The gods came together and concocted the plan of making the world. Two steps here. This is critical because we're going to see it in every other account now. Rosh means that the head god brought forth the gods. And, the, and then these gods, once brought forth, devised a plan to create the world. Okay? This will be critical when I get to the Sermon in the Grove because Pancras doesn't understand at all that in the Sermon in the Grove, Joseph Smith is parsing the word Elohim, not the word Rosh. <laughs> And I'm going to show how he completely misunderstands what's happening. This is from the Willard Richard notes, page 341 of the words of Joseph Smith. The head, the head, or the head one, the head one of the gods brought forth the gods. The head one called the gods together in grand council to bring forth the world. In the beginning, the head of the gods called the grand council of gods and concocted a scheme to create the world. Okay. William Clayton report, this is page 358 of the words of Joseph Smith. I will go to the old Bible, the very Bereshet, make a comment and the first sentence of the history of creation. Bereshet, want to analyze the word, bay, in the beginning through and everything else. Rosh, the head, shet, where do it come from? When the inspired man wrote it, he did not put the bed there. I'm just, and this is how they transliterate it. I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not illiterate in Hebrew, okay? <laughs> but a Jew put it there. It read the, in the first, the head one of the gods brought forth the gods. In that meaning, Roshit signifies to bring forth the Elohim. Hence, the head God brought forth the head God in the Grand Council, okay? So what it means is the head God brings forth the head gods in, the, in this Grand Council because the gods in the, Grand Council are called the head gods or heads of the gods. The head god is bringing them together, okay? Now, this is really critical. I'm now going to go to the Sermon in the Grove. It was given 16 June 1844. It's a different sermon. What Pancras does is he completely avoids any of the text in the King Follett Discourse where every single account is consistent. Joseph Smith is taking the very first word of the Bible, Bereshet, and he is He's analyzing it and saying what it really means is the head one of the gods brought forth the gods, okay? Because the word Rosh means head. <laughs> there, or the begin, it, it means the, 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 the principle or the primary or something like that, okay, in Hebrew. That's what it actually means. So instead of dealing with those texts, because it doesn't agree with his interpretation at all, because the notion that there would be a head god means that there's not um, an infinity an infinite re regress of gods. It means there's a head God, and it's not consistent with his reading, so he avoids it. What Joseph Smith is doing in the Sermon in the Grove is different. Instead of parsing the word Rosh, as he does in the King Philip discourse, he's parsing the second word, Bereshet Elohim. And so what he, that's the first, the, the first, you know, very first sentence of, of the Bible as it begins. And what he does, he takes the word Elohim and notices it's plural. And this is what it says. He says, and this is from the Thomas Bullock report. Now, we have a bit of a deficit in the Sermon in the Grove because we only have one account. And we know that his text is fairly mangled. <laughs> we can tell from um, other accounts that we have but and what he says and where he messes up several scriptures and just gets them wrong because we know what Joseph Smith is quoting. But here's, here's what Thomas Bullock had. Um, I will show from the Hebrew Bible 
and the first word shows a plurality of gods, a little Hebrew, Baroshet, in the beginning, Roshet, the head. It should read the heads of, to organize that gods, Elohim Eloi, God, singular, Kim, renders gods. In the beginning, the heads of the gods organized the heaven and the earth. So here's what happens. Pankratz takes this text and said, oh, it shouldn't be the head god. It should be the heads of the gods. It even says later, if we, pers if we pursue the Hebrew, this is the, the Sermon in the Grove. If we pursue the Hebrew further, it reads. Now, notice he's saying if we pursue the Hebrew further, it reads. The head one, the head one of the gods said, let us make man in our image. The word Elohim ought to be plural all the way through. Gods, the heads of the gods appointed one God for us. So the Sermon in the Grove is dealing with the second step after the head God organizes the council. It's dealing with the Elohim. And so what he's saying is the Elohim are a council that has been called together by gods, and they're going to create the world. So what Joseph Smith is, de is dealing with um, in the Sermon in the Grove is actually the, the second word <laughs> in the first sentence of the Hebrew Bible, not the first one which Pankratz just avoids entirely, and I believe on purpose. This is the McIntyre notebook. It's in the words of Joseph Smith, 383. He says, by referring to the first Genesis, as in, in the original Hebrew, that read, in the beginning, the head gods organized the earth and the heavens. And also, um, and he, he, called, he quotes Psalm, and also the 82 Psalm, first verse, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, he judgeth among the gods. Now, here's an interesting thing. Pankratz says, well, it says the heads of the gods organize the heaven and the earth. So Joseph Smith didn't believe in a head god. He believed in plurality of God, only the heads of gods. He doesn't understand that, that Joseph Smith is not parsing the word Rosh here. He's parsing the word Elohim. And he's dealing with the second step after, the, the, after God organizes the council of the gods. The council of the gods organizes the earth. That's what he's dealing with in the Sermon in the Grove. But then Joseph Smith goes on to quote this, the eight, Psalm 82 to show that he actually believes in a head God, because there's one head God that calls all the other gods together in council, which is exactly what Psalm 82 actually means, by the way, because in, in Psalm 82, Elohim is calling all of the gods to a, a court to accuse them and to hold court. <laughs> um, so let me just lay out what the scheme is that Joseph Smith was laying out in the King Philip Discourse and in the Sermon in the Grove. First, Rosh, um, without the beginning, Beth, is singular. Can't be made plural. There's no meme on Rosh, okay? Second, the head God brought forth the gods um, is the consistent reading of every single source of the King Philip Discourse. Next, the heads of the gods constituting the council, and they created a plan to create the world. And fifth, the word gods is Elohim. It's a plural word, um, which Joseph Smith, and so what we're dealing with is he translates this, the head god brought forth the gods, and he translates Elohim as a council of gods that will then proceed to organize the world. Pancras doesn't understand any of that. He avoids the relevant texts. He mangles the relevant texts in a way that that really, you know, let's give him the benefit of the doubt and just say this is shoddy scholarship rather than that he's being wholly dishonest, okay? Well, before you uh, continue, let me just say, um, <clears throat> when, uh, when I read the article, I decided to reread McIntyre's uh, <coughs> notes. And even in the show notes, I sent you a kind of notes like, Joseph, even if you just to uh, rely on McIntyre's notes, it's like he quotes Psalm 82, where s there's a singular God speaking to plural gods. Uh, and then there's the uh, use of Revelation 1, 6 and other texts. So e even being generous, it's like uh, it's a mangling of all the sources, including McIntyre's um, abbreviated account. So like, but basically a TLDR is like, Joseph did teach there's a singular head God, but there's a council of gods who in many respects could be called a head, head gods as well, but they're still subordinate functionally at least to a singular person who's the head god and that's unanimous in the uh, accounts yeah no that, that that's exactly right i now want to go to the text i'm going to actually do my best to share the screen here um 
So I'm going to highlight this and I'm going to So let me come back. You'll see what I'm doing. And I'm sharing now. So can you see the text now? So I can even blow this up more in case you can't read it. Uh, it's okay. Yeah, that, that's perfect as it is now. Okay. So here's the next point I want to make. Pankratz argues that Joseph Smith is actually denying that God has been God from all eternity, or is, he's denying that God has been God from all eternity, and therefore that eviscerates my argument. He takes the text and says what they really mean, he's, he's denying, if we look at the text, they consistently say that he's refuting the idea that God has been God from all eternity. He's missing two points, because I'm not even going to fuss with that, because the text as to whether Joseph Smith is refuting the idea that God has been God from all eternity are really quite inconsistent. I, I just want to admit that up front. Here's what he's missing. Immediately after saying what that God has not been God from all eternity, he expressly explains why that is in context it, in every single account of the King Philip discourse, every single time. And then he explains that, that the father, just like the son, had the power to bring to raise himself up from the dead. I'm just going to make this point about that because we're going to see it in the text. Only a divine person has the power of resurrection. Only a divine person. So if, if we accept his argument that the Father became um, divine only after, just a second, let me grab this. If we accept that the Father became divine only after his resurrection, how did he have power within himself to raise himself up as only a divine being did, could? So this is the text. Um, and I, this is from the w Wilford Woodruff Diary, okay? You can see this is 3 o'clock p.m., April, Sunday, 7th, 1844. And here's what it says. Um, we suppose that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea, or I, I will do away or take away the veil so you may see. It is the first principle to know that we may converse with him, and he was once a man like us. And a father was once on an earth like us. Okay? So the reason that God has not been God from all eternity is that he was once on an earth like us. It's what Joseph Smith is explaining. And I wish I was in a suitable place to tell it. The scriptures inform us, mark it, that Jesus Christ said, As the Father hath power in himself, so hath the Son power in himself to do what the Father did, even to lay down my body and take it up again. So what he's saying is that the father, like the son, had a, had a power that only a, a divine person could have. So if he wasn't already divine, how did he have a power that only a, a divine person could have? Um, so, and we can even go to this. This is where he's, he's discussing Bereshit. Um, so you can see what the original text is saying. Bereshit, in the beginning, analyze the word in and through. An old Jew added the word bath. It read, had one of the gods, brought forth the gods. Okay. Now, I'm going to go to the next version here. This is the Thomas Bullock report. Okay. And this is what we have here. And it's right here. This is... 69. And what it reads is, see if I can find what I'm looking for. Because I want to talk about where it talks about, we suppose God has been God from all eternity. If it's taking too long, just let me know. I <laughs> know oh, you're, you're all good. It's fine. And by the way, while you find that, I'll just note for listeners in the show notes, I'll include a link to my blog where I reproduce the uh, original texts of the King Fuller Discourse at the uh, relevant section here. And here it is, okay? This is the key text right here. 
I'm going to tell you, and it's, I'm going to tell you what sort of a being of God, for he was God from the beginning of all eternity, and if I do not refute it. So you can see that's, it's a fairly vague text. I'm pretty sure Joseph Smith didn't say it exactly like that. But I'm not sure what he is saying, but this is what he does say. Truth is this touchstone there, simple, and first principle of truth to know for certainty the character of God, that we may converse with him, same as a man, and God himself, the father of us all, dwelt on an earth, same as Jesus himself did, and I will show it from the Bible. So once again, the reason immediately follows that he's, whether he's refuting or not, that God has been God from all eternity, and the reason for that is that God himself, the father of us all, dwelt on an, an earth the same as Jesus himself did, okay? Um, we get the same discussion, by the way, of Bereshithu, uh, and I'll just show you. Um, Bereshith, in, by, through, and everything else. Rashad, the head, when the inspired man wrote it, did not put the first to it. A man, a Jew without any authority, thought it too bad to begin to talk about the head of any man. The head one of the gods brought forth the gods is the true meaning of the word. If you do not believe it, you do not believe the learned man of God. No man can tell you more than I do. Thus the head God brought forth the gods in the head council. So what we're dealing with there is that the head gods and brings forth the council. When he's referring to the God of gods or the head of the gods, he's referring to that council. Now I want to go down to this one as well. Um, this may take just a second, too. Yeah. So this, this is the key text here, okay? We have imagined that God was God from all eternity. By the way, here we're reading from the William Clayton Report. We have imagined that God was God from all eternity. These are incomprehensible to some, but are the first principle of the gospel, to know that we may converse with him as one man with another, and that he was once as one of us, and was on a planet as Jesus was in the flesh. I have the privilege to tell the story in such a manner as persecution would cease forever. Said Jesus, mark it, brother Rigdon. What did Jesus say? As the Father hath power in himself, even so the Son hath the Son power. So to do what? Why what the Father did, to lay down his body and took it up again. Um, and so what he's arguing is that when the Father was was mortal he had this divine power to take his to lay down his life and take it up again just as jesus did um and this he goes through this again i'm not quite sure um why it's here twice but i'm going to show that it's very consistent this is a better shit want to analyze the word apparently joseph smith addressed it twice bay in by and through and everything else rosh the head Shech. where do it come from when the inspired man wrote it, he did not put the bed there, but a Jew put it there. It read in the first, the head one of the gods brought forth the gods, is the true meaning. Roshit signifies to bring forth the Elohim. So what Joseph Smith is saying is the head God is organizing a council of gods. Um, this is a Samuel W. Richards. Um, must know only the living and true God in Jesus Christ to have eternal life. God, a man like one of us, even like Adam, not God from all eternity, once on a planet with flesh and blood like Jesus, like Christ. What Willard Richards is understanding is that the Father is not God from all eternity because he was once on a planet like Jesus. So the reason he's not God from all eternity isn't that he hadn't been God from eternity prior, but that like Jesus, he was God before he became mortal he emptied himself of his divinity and became divine. And so those are basically the accounts that we have um, that we're dealing with. And um, I'm trying to bring back up the, the uh, trying to bring back up the, video, but it's not coming up. Do you know how to splice things in? <laughs> you click on the stop sharing button. Well, I don't have it up. It's not, it's not coming up on my screen.
because can you can you click oh there you go click on the dot to stop sharing you you did it good job yeah, that's fine uh yeah technology works when it, uh except when you need it to work but um but basically the takeaway from that basically is in the king follow discourse the different accounts of it uh joseph con is consistently presented as teaching that there's a singular head god not a plural head god in the context of the roach or the head in his interpretation of the first word of genesis but when he speaks of head gods plural it's the heavenly council if you will but it's still presided by this singular head god i who we would identify with god the father if you will so right. um so basically it's pretty disingenuous to claim like well because in one account there's head gods ignoring the context like the use of psalm 82 which has like one god uh over, uh, overseeing a plurality of gods and so forth um it, it's pretty disingenuous to claim like um no joseph only taught head gods plural well pancras doesn't understand the argument at all he even he even quotes um kevin barney a friend of mine as to what the argument is i don't think he even read kevin barney's argument because he clearly lays out that what joseph smith is doing in the king fellow discourse is parsing the word rosh coming from Bereshit shit in in uh, genesis 1 and 1 and when he's doing that he's dealing with the singular word head and it means the head god brought forth to gods and it's very clear that in the in the sermon in the grove which he gave uh, uh, two months later he's not parsing the word parsing the word elohim which is plural and he's explaining that the the, the gods and the council of gods organize the earth. It's not inconsistent at all. He simply doesn't understand what, either what Joseph Smith is doing or the argument that I made, by the way. And, and, um, and for uh, listeners, by the way, Kevin Burney's article, and Kevin's brilliant, by the way, uh, he it's examining six key concepts in Joseph Smith's understanding of Genesis 1-1 in, in the BYU Studies Journal. Um, right. Very good article, by the way. It is a good article. Now, let me point out in addition, there are a number of arguments that Pankratz makes that he just totally mangles. Pankratz is correct that if, if, G, if the father is like Jesus and that they both have power to lay down their lives, it doesn't mean necessarily that the, the father is like Jesus and that he was divine beforehand, just like Jesus was. But there's a clear pattern set up in the King Follett Discourse and in the Sermon in the Grove. And because Joseph Smith taught very clearly, and I, um, I, I think I can show it fairly clearly that the Holy Ghost, and, and this is from the Samuel W. Richards, um, words of Joseph Smith, 361. God, a man like one of us, Adam, not God from all eternity, once on a planet with flesh and blood. Again, he's, on a, he, he's not God from all eternity because he once became mortal, not because he would, was not God from all eternity. As the Father hath life in himself, and etc., to know God, to learn to become exalted um, by the addition of the subject, family, or kingdom. The other thing to, to note, and this is important, here's what Pankratz argues. I argue that the Father is only, is, the Son is doing what he saw the Father do. When the father was mortal, he had a divine power like Christ did, to lay down his life and take it up again, and only a divine person has that power. But Christ was also divine before becoming mortal. In Philippians, it says that Christ empties himself of his divine glory in order to become mortal. It's in Philippians 2. What's even more important is that in Philippians, and, and I want to read this, I think this is important. Um, in Philippians 2 and 9, um, what he's saying is that, and probably I will just pull this up here. I don't want to leave this up too long. And this is this is why it's important. Two things, okay? Um, what what is actually being taught, and Joseph Smith is totally consistent with this. Um, and this is it. So this is beginning in verse six, who he's talking about Christ in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing 
what's translated here is he made himself nothing is, is from the Greek verb kenosis, which means to empty himself by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. Now, here's what I want to point out about that scripture. What's happening here is, it says very clearly that Christ is already in the form of God. He's the pre-existent divine being. Christ empties himself of his divinity in order to become mortal, okay? He's then exalted, and God super exalts him. Now, I want to put that in the context of Prankratz's ridiculous argument. Here's his argument. He goes back to the lectures on faith and, and basically manages them and argues that what the lectures on faith are saying is that Christ became exalted at the resurrection. He infers from that that Christ was not exalted before that time, and therefore he was not God. And in fact, I think we can quote from his article, um, and this is what he argues. Um, lecture fifth of the lectures teaches that Jesus, having overcome, received a fullness of the glory of the Father. Later in lecture seventh, in the lectures on faith, it taught that Jesus Christ is the prototype of a saved and glorified person. He is the example for us to follow, a person who through faith has become perfect enough to lay hold upon eternal life. This early summary of the theology of Joseph Smith developed depicts Jesus advancing from having a non-deified status to being one who takes hold of eternal life, having received the fullness of glory. Here's why that's so egregious. What's happening here, it says repeatedly in the King Philip discourse, and he knows it, that Christ, he's going to take one glory, and then um, because he is already exalted, you move from exaltation to exaltation. Here's what Joseph Smith said in the in Wilford Woodruff Journal. What did Jesus do? The same thing as I see the Father do. What? Work out a kingdom. When I do so, I will give to the Father, which will add to his glory, the Father's glory. He will take a higher exaltation, and I will take his place, and I am also exalted. What Pankratz knows, and it's very clear, is that the Father moves from one exaltation to another, just as Christ moves from one exaltation to another. It's not the case that Christ wasn't deified before becoming mortal. Joseph Smith's thought is absolutely consistent on this point. Jesus Christ is the preexistent maker of the world. In fact, we can look at what the, um, the lectures on the faith say about this. The very lecture that he's, he's quote, this is in, in uh, 2 and 6. And I, God, said unto my only begotten, which was with me from the beginning. Let us make man in our own image after our likeness, and it was so. So what's happening here is that Christ is, is the, the one that God is speaking to when he makes the creation, when he says, let us. In 5 and 2, there are two personages who constitute the grand, and I'm going to have to put on my glasses, matchless governing and supreme power over all things, by whom all things were created. They are the Father and the Son. Being begotten of him and ordained from the foundation of the world to be a propitiation for sins for all those who believe in him. Having overcome, received the fullness of glory of the Father, possessing the same mind as the Father. He's quoting from the here, having the same mind as the Father. What he's referring to is moving from one exaltation to another. So the argument that Pankratz is making is a ridiculous argument. It's very clear that Joseph Smith believes that they're in, in eternal progression from one exaltation to another. We can see this again in DNC 93, which is, by, by the way, being summarized in the fifth lecture on faith. It's Mosiah um, 16 and, or Mosiah 15 and um, the fifth lecture on faith that are being summarized. Uh, that are summar being summarized in, in that fifth lecture anyway. So um, in 
section 93 and 8, Jesus is already the preexistent word. He's the word referred to in, in the Gospel of John. The word was in the beginning with God, and the word was God. In the beginning, the word was with God. And so what that's showing is that the word, as the word, he's already a divine being. He's a God. Um, he is the light and redeemer of the world, the spirit of truth. 93 and 10, the worlds were made by him. Um, when they were made by him, through him and of him. Um, 93 and 12, he received not of the fullness at first, but then received a greater fullness. And so what a fullness means is an already exalted being is receiving yet a higher exaltation, just as Joseph Smith was explaining in the King Follett Discourse. The Father is further exalted by the Son. And the son is further exalted by what he does. It's not as if he wasn't the pre-existent divine word. Um, that's Joseph Smith's teaching. And so Pankratz mangles this to try to argue that the argument that I make, that when Joseph Smith says he does exactly what he saw the father do, but I point out that Christ was divine prior to his mortal probation, and therefore the father did what he did, he's like him in that respect as well. Pancras says, well, that, that can't be, but it doesn't matter because Jesus wasn't divine before his, his moral probation either, which is nonsense. And let's point out, in addition, that the Holy Ghost, Joseph Smith taught that the Holy Ghost is yet a body and that he will become fully divine um, again. He'll take upon himself a body someday and that he, um, like the Father and the Son, will be resurrected. So what we see here is a pattern. The divine persons in the Godhead are divine from all eternity. They lay aside their divinity to become mortal. And then they are, are exalted even further because of what they've gone through in their mortal experience. And they glorify one another, just as John says. So Pankratz's argument is really a mangling, but not merely a mangling of texts. It's avoiding what is obvious from the Mormon texts in Joseph Smith's positions. And that I have a hard time reconciling that with an honest approach to the text, just personally. No, that's good. Um, so I think like a lot of confusion, especially from like say either well-meaning, I don't think Pankratz is well-meaning, but like well-meaning people who are looking in from the outside. Uh, for Joseph Smith, um, exaltation was not like say an upper limit. There was like, you could think of it like the analogy of say uh, steps on a ladder. You know, you're exalted, but that doesn't mean like you can't be exalted more and more and receive more and more glory. Like even in the uh, Philippian hymn you quote, like, um, you know, Jesus is given the name above all other names, but and people will worship him. But the tell us that that worship is not like, say, the glorification of the Son alone. The Father also receives glorification as a result. And then there's like a very ingenious use of Isaiah 45 in the Septuagint, you know, uh, and other things like that, uh, which you discuss in um, A God and Gods. But... Uh, that's yeah. I, even like some Trinitarians admit that, like uh, Tony Costa, who's not a, who's not friendly towards Mormonism, in his uh, book on um, uh, worship of Christ in the Pauline letters, um, he has a very good discussion actually of the Carmen Christi Philippians two six to eleven on this point as well. So I think that's the one that, that has like led to like a lot of confusion by both critics and also well-meaning people who are uh, not maybe not familiar with Joseph Smith's theology and so forth. You know, there's no upper limit. So. Right, uh, but and also he, the idea like Jesus was not ex uh, was not divine prior to um, his exaltation after the resurrection. Um, not only do you have like a wealth of New Testament texts to uh, explain away, like you know Hebrews one eight uh, ten to twelve and other texts like that, even uniquely the Latter Day Saint texts like section ninety three, which is a fair wish. Um, Jesus in his pre existence, he's clearly God. He's divine. He's the agent of the Genesis creation. Um, so. Yeah. Well, it's in the Book of Mormon as well. When Jesus oh, appeared, yeah. tells the Nephites he's the one who gave the law. He already has the divine name. I mean, in John, as a mortal, he uses the divine name and says, I am. And it's clear that in Joseph Smith's later thought, the son is with the father as God. He's the word. And the way that Pankratz avoids those texts, the way that he mangles the text and argues that for Joseph Smith, Jesus wasn't divine before becoming mortal is, is really just not forgivable. I mean, no competent scholar would make that claim. 
Yeah, um, it, it's kind of like the uh, common well LDS Christology's Aryan or something like that. It's like you have to be very ignorant of LDS theology that you can claim that. Um, yeah. Now, like maybe like one or two, um, maybe like a pushback here and there. Like uh, some LDS, this uh, might say like, um, well, when I say it's like uh, Christ did what the Father did, of course that's like say taking up a body. But like some claim, well, this supports the common idea among some in some circles that. Uh, the father atoned for sins or like it was a savior figure just like christ was on another earth so do you think that's an example of like reading too much into Jesus, uh, joseph's comments there um about the father and the son in that respect at least i, I do i th i think it's an open question and not well settled joseph smith when and it was probably his his um scribe william parish who wrote the actual text of the poem i don't know but in a poem, he says that Christ, and he's what he's doing is he's it's a poem about uh, section 76, the division of three degrees of glory, in which he says that Christ atoned for all worlds for all time, which would mean that we only have one atonement. But I think we ought to just admit that the texts are not um, totally clear on whether the father also atoned. My belief is that he did not. Um, based upon the kinds of readings that I've given, and I think the kinds of things said in the New Testament, we have one Savior, we don't need another. I agree. Uh, and so that would be my view, but I would be willing to admit there's room for disagreement in the text. Yeah, um, Brigham, especially in a lot of these Adam God the uh, theology, did kind of view uh, that to be like an ongoing process. But uh, yeah. Um, and by the way, like you mentioned Phelps, and he's possible reworking, uh, he's poetical reworking of it. Um, it's going to be noted by some uh, that... Yeah, I mean, W. Phelps, I think I said Parrish. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. But um, let me just get it here. Uh, just because you mentioned Phelps, I just might as well mention this, that your interpretation of what Joseph said is not actually unique to you, like others have uh, argued for that. For instance, um, Samuel Brown, um, in his essay, William Phelps's Paracletus, an early witness to Joseph Smith's Divine Anthropology, uh, International Journal of Mormon Studies to Spring 2009, 60s, which is actually online. It's an interesting article. Um, he's discussing uh, Phelps, who was writing under the pen name Joseph Speckled Bird uh, in the Times and Seasons in 1845. Um, he actually presented that uh, our God and Father is the head of the gods, so like a uh, very um, kinship monotheistic reading of the text. Um, so beyond presenting the link between Joseph Smith and Young's Adam God, uh, Phelps' short story provides windows on several other aspects of early Mormon belief, contrary to the infinite regress view and in support of Blake Oster's kinship monotheism. Phelps reports a head, singular God, one intimately identified with the Lord God of the Old Testament. He would later equivocate on the spine following uncertain cues in Joseph Smith's June 1844 sermon in the Grove, and contrary to some versions of Brigham Young's Adam God formulation, Adam was not an immature immortal, and the head of the uh, remained involved in earthly affairs. Uh, so Phelps, at least when he was writing that the Paracletus in 1845, followed a singular head God view. Now he would uh, equivocate a bit later in his life, but um, I kind of noticed, uh, noticed like uh, this is not exactly like a novel interpretation that's been um, around even if it's been a minority view for a uh, while anyway. Well, let, let's point out something else. In the Sermon in the Grove, Joseph is saying he learned something by translating the papyri that he had, um, which is, of course, the Book of Abraham. The Book of Abraham, um, probably this part was translated in 1842. It's part of Joseph Smith's later teachings. It's, it's chapter three. And in the Book of Abraham, he very clearly teaches that there is one intelligence that is more intelligent than all of the other intelligences, and that it is the Lord God. I'm going to begin in, in 18 here. Howbeit that he made the greater star, as also if there be two spirits, one shall be more intelligent than the other. Yet these two spirits, notwithstanding one is more intelligent than the other, have no beginning. They existed before, they shall have no end. They shall exist after, for they are noam, or eternal. I think we should just say, ha, oh, I'm there. And, and <laughs> in any event, that's the Hebrew. And the Lord said unto me, these two facts do exist. There are two spirits, one being more intelligent than the other. There shall be one more intelligent than they. I am the Lord God. I am more intelligent than they all. Um, and then he, he uh, in verse 21, I dwell in the midst of them all. I now therefore have come down unto thee to declare unto thee the works 
which my hands have made, wherein my wisdom excelleth them all. So what the, the view that is that most people take, I think, take to be taught in the Sermon in the Grove is that there's this infinite regress of gods. There's not a head God. And there was a father God, and then he had a son, a father God, had a son ad infinitum. But what Joseph Smith is actually saying is that there is a head God, and this Lord God, the head God of all of them, is more intelligent than all of the other intelligences. And so if we take the entire universe of intelligences, there is one who is most intelligent. And of course, it's if there's one that's most intelligent, then and, and he's the one who's in charge. He makes it clear. <laughs> so what I I take it that, and then we have the statement in DNC 121, I forget the verse off the top of my head, that God is the God of all other gods in the Council of Gods. And that I think that's a is that an 1839 revelation, um, the NC 121? And so what we've got is a very consistent teaching. There is a God of all other gods. He's the head God. He's the most intelligent of all the intelligences. It's not a teaching of an infinite regress of gods. God has not been God from all eternity because at one point in time, like Jesus, he became mortal. And that's expressly what Joseph Smith is teaching. Jesus became mortal because he was divine before becoming mortal, took upon himself a body, had the power of resurrection, which is a divine power, and in resurrecting became further exalted. The father did the same thing. He laid aside his, his divinity, became mortal, had the power of resurrection as only a divine being has. He was resurrected and then he was further exalted. When the, when the son was exalted, that also exalts the father. So that's kind of the view. And I think the solid textual basis for it, um, in addition to the fact that it would be inconsistent with the over 100 scriptural statements that God is God from all eternity, where there is one God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, the eternal God without beginning <laughs> or end. So we have all these scriptural statements. And I suspect that what Pankratz is doing is he wants an easier target to attack on behalf of, ev of evangelicals. And the view that I present, I believe that this monarchical view, because the people writing the Old and New Testaments used the metaphor of, a, of an earthly king as the model for God. God is a king, hence a monarch, hence monarchical theism. <laughs> um, and I call it monarchical theism. And what it means is that God is viewed as, as like a king. The king isn't different from his subjects. He's not ontologically different, okay? There were some kings who wanted to claim that, but they weren't. <laughs> the king is like his subjects, but his duty is to serve all of them. Their duty is to give obeisance in, in exchange. So the king protects them. He has armies that will protect them, just as in the Old and the New Testament. There are divine armies that protect us. It's the king's job. But we must give loyalty to the king. We have a covenant duty to not recognize any other kings, because that would be treason. <laughs> So that's how this, this metaphor works. No, that's good. And you do bring up like a very important point, like your reading and interpretation of these sermons is consistent with what came beforehand. For instance, um, uh, the various texts speak about God being God from all eternity. Now, one could say like, well, when it comes to say the Old Testament text or the Book of Mormon, you're dealing with translation literature and for the ancients, they did not have very modern conceptions of eternity and so forth. And that's true. However, uh, many of these revelations are revealed in English, like Section 20 and other texts, so you can't argue, well, Olam or what have you, you know, could refer to, like, a very long period of time, you know, it, in the 19th century, it meant eternity and everlasting. So, um, if one believes Joseph's theology uh, was consistent, uh, at least substantially so, your reading of the Sermon in the Grove and Kinfola Discourse produces a more consistent um interpretation of Joseph Smith's theology, including the Book of Abraham text that you referenced as well. Well, and let me point out, he doesn't have to be consistent in, in any logical sense. One cannot think of a bigger change than the change from the law of Moses to the law that Jesus gave in the Sermon um, on the Mount that, and, and no longer being bound by the law of Moses. This is a big change. And it's, you know, in terms of lifestyle, it's very inconsistent. 
but I, and I'm not one that believes that the scriptures are totally consistent. I think there are a lot of different views. Some of them are conflicting. And um, I believe there, there's a lot more consistency, however, in Joseph Smith's views. And if you're going to argue that there's been a change in a view, you've got to offer the evidence. And when you do so, you can't ignore the key evidence. You can't mangle the key evidence. And you can't misrepresent it the way that Pankratz has. I think a parallel example, and we've both addressed this one as well, is was early Latter-day Saint Christology a form of modalism? Right. Um, you know, you kind of hear like, and yeah, there are like certain texts that if you were to ignore before and after, they seem like they are difficult texts, like the first few verses of Mosiah 15 and a few other texts. But if you actually look at the context and engage in like any meaningful exegesis or like look at the uh, entire context of Joseph's writings and so forth, he clearly was not a modalist, even in the early days of the church. Um, you know, uh, there is a clear distinction of the person, the father and the son. Um, you have a very good article, by the way, in Element uh, that people should look up. And uh, only a few weeks ago, I actually had a uh, very fun three-hour discussion with someone um, going through like uh, various proof texts that's on my YouTube channel, um, where we kind of discuss Mosiah 15 and a number of other issues as well, like um, the indiscernibility of identicals um, and other yeah, issues I, as well. So. Actually, I, I caught a part of that already. It's it's a very lengthy kind of discussion. But in, in the Element article, revisioning the Mormon concept of God, not even Mosiah 15 could possibly be um, understood as, as somehow modalistic. Yeah, the very yeah. fact like Jesus after the resurrection intercedes in front of someone else yeah. would clear that there's clearly two indexicals or two someones in view there. Not well, it's not only that, but his will is swallowed up in the will of the Father. There are yeah. two wills. <laughs> and and to try to read modalism into it would make nonsense of the text. So, yeah, even no, that's... Okay. But I agree with you. Most And they do the same thing they do with the King Follett discourse in the Sermon in the Grove. There's this kind of facial reading. They get this understanding. It gets perpetuated. And that's kind of what's happened with the Book of Mormon texts like Mosiah 15. They read it. It's kind of a facial reading. They're not careful with the text, and that's what comes out of it. Okay. Um, well, I know, like, uh, that's Bancrat's uh, arguments that are actually taken care of, but, like, uh, there's some, like, uh, people who have, like, interacted, and, of course, with more good faith uh, from the LDS side with your view. Sure. Um, so, like, sometimes they might bring up, like, a few things uh, in terms of, say, its reception history, like, there's evidence that Wilfred Woodruff and others interpret Joseph to be teaching the infinite regress of gods. Um, for instance, um, and this is uh, something that's been published recently, um, Wilfred Woodruff, Book of Revelations, January 3rd, 1842. Um, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ was once the same as the Son or Holy Ghost, but having redeemed the world became the eternal God of that world. He had a Son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed this earth the same as his Father, had a world which uh, made them equal and the Holy Ghost would do the same in his turn. And so would all the saints who inherited a celestial glory, so there would be gods many and lords many. Um, I know like some LDS have used that um, to support like say, well at least Wilfred Woodruff uh, interpreted, uh, or at least held a theology of infinite regress and the more traditional understanding as well. So um, do you have any I didn't about hear that? I didn't hear anything about infinite regress in that quote actually. Yeah. <laughs> What I heard was was that there was a Father, a Son, and a Holy Ghost, and and that, I mean, maybe I've got to look at it more carefully. I just don't see how it supports infinite regress. Yeah, maybe it's the fact like uh, some would point like uh, how the Father redeemed the world, became the eternal God of that world. Uh, some would. And that's consistent with my interpretation of the King Follett discourse in the Sermon in the Grove. Yeah. So. You know, if he redeemed the world, that's it's inconsistent with my understanding of perhaps the atonement saying that I believe there's only one atonement. And where was Wilfred Woodruff in 1842? Wasn't he in England? Uh, yeah, well, 1842, uh, that's where he dates it. But, like, unfortunately, like, if you study his diary, sometimes he writes something, but he uh, dates it to the uh, time it took place well after the fact. Um, so. Right. Well, I'm just saying, I do, it seems like he couldn't have gotten it from Joseph Smith at that time period. <laughs> No, I just thought I'd ask you that because, like, that's a common one that's uh, being um, produced every so often, uh, largely because it uh, appears in the Joseph Smith Papers volume um, and other sources as well. Um, let's see. 
So, what do you think are, like, um, well, maybe I should ask you this, like, uh, although you re reject the infinite regress view, like, um, logically speaking, though, uh, and I know you've addressed this, um, is an infinite regress actually a possibility, in, proceeding from, like, the debate about infinite regress of gods, because often... I find there's no logical problem in an infinite regress. Um, I've, I've written several articles. It's logically possible that there is an actual infinity, and I... An infinite regress is not an actual infinity, it's a serial infinity, and nobody's argued that those are logically possible that I know of. <laughs> yeah, in fact, you actually have a very good article on um, can an actual uh, infinity exist in the uh, Paulson uh, French grift. Um, right. So right. it's actually on your, uh, the PDF of it is actually on uh, your website at blakeoster.com. So if anyone, um, it's a bit heavy when it comes to math, so you may have to read like two or three times. I know I have to, um, <laughs> but it, it's a very good article because like one of the objections when it comes to say, um, not just like an infinite regress of gods, but like say that we personally pre-existed eternally. Uh, William Lane Craig makes this argument like, well, an actual infinite cannot exist. You know, it's a logical impossibility. But like you've done like, a very good job. Uh, a sector example will be uh, the work of Graham Oppie on his book on the topic as well. He's an atheist, but he's one of the better atheists because he's. Um, pretty he has a lot of intellectual integrity and he's done very good works reviewing the kalam argument and things like that so yeah no i i think all there are hardly any arguments that william lane craig gives that i agree with so <laughs> but and this this one in particular i think is is um kalam cosmological arguments there's two forms one's an inductive form based upon the big bang unfortunately it's based upon a view of the big bang that's been superseded years ago and he has a logical argument and neither one holds much water. So, and I've actually written articles about all those versions. Um, and those I think can be found on my website as well. So. Okay, well, uh, is there, I think we've kind of uh, addressed like a lot of the uh, common um, arguments. Um, is there anything you wish to clarify about your position or your reading of the text? Um, because I know so, even some people who have had you on in podcasts seems at times in good faith uh, not to sometimes get what you were arguing for. So is there any other points of clarification you'd like to make or make much more explicit? I don't think so. I mean, the most common misunderstanding of my position, as I said, is the view that humans are somehow ontologically different than the Godhead. I do want to make this distinction ontologically about the Godhead. The status that we have as individuals is not a status as a fully divine person. Divinity is necessarily a relational reality or property, okay? Nobody could become a god all by themselves. Some people have the view that we become gods by flying out some corner in the universe that God hasn't quite gotten to yet. We take a bunch of wives there and we populate it and organize it, okay? Now that's kind of a caricature, but it's probably pretty accurate for some people. That is not the view that I have, okay? Um, I, I just want to make clear that our divinity arises from the unity of the divine persons. That's, I mean, we could call it, a, a you know, the, the perichoresis is, I think, the, the technical term used by the, by the Greek early theologians, where, where we're in this kind of dance, if you will, of that, that we're, we love each other so much that a unity has arisen where we share a common power, common knowledge, um, common purpose, and we are so unified that what one does, another does. And the action is at the level of the Godhead, not at the level of an individual person. However, when we act as individual human beings, as Christ did and so forth, we can I'm going to use this non-technical term. We can tie into God's power, if you will, to um, perform miracles and so forth. But it's not in virtue of our own power that we're doing it. It's a shared power. So I wanted, I just want to make sure there is an ontological distinction that I would make between persons who are in the Godhead and fully deified and those who are not and are acting as individuals. And I think there's an analogy that I would use. So when you have two atoms of hydrogen and one of oxygen, you've got water. Water can sustain life. But if you were in the desert with a bunch of oxygen and a bunch of hydrogen, as you are every single day, you're still going to die. It's only when they're a molecular unity that they have the life-saving power that you need when you're in the middle of the desert. Okay. So when things are unified in particular ways, they can give rise to properties that they don't have individually. 
And that's the way it is with us in becoming deified. We don't do it on our own. And in fact, as Joseph Smith taught, it's really an endeavor for the entire human family. And I think that he would teach that to the extent even one person is left behind our, our own happiness, our own glory, and our own exaltation is diminished. Okay. And so this is necessarily a human family type of endeavor. And he taught that there's nobody who's not in the family. <laughs> okay. This is an amazing teaching. We, the goal is exaltation and deification for everyone to be in this divine relationship. And I love the view. I find it so strongly in John 14 through 17, where we've been invited into this divine relationship because they love us so much. I mean, that just is the essence of the gospel to me. Um, and I, I think it's, you know, achieving that reality is, is the greatest good known to us. There's nothing greater than that. And nobody gets left behind. <laughs> Yeah, and um, when it comes to St. John and uh, the Johannine literature, there's a very strong emphasis on uh, the idea of Christification, like we'll become just like Christ is. You know, um, one text I often appeal to, especially in the book of Revelation, and I think you pointed this out as well, where we are invited to sit on the throne singular of God. And all of Richard Bachman, I think, has uh, really butchered what this means. It means that, um, it doesn't mean like a divine identity a la Bachman, but it means that we'll be Christified, just as like Christ is uh, glorified by the Father, through God, Christ, through the grace of God, you know, and by Christ's atonement and so forth, will be glorified and coheres with uh, Jesus, you know. Uh, that's yeah. the idea of the throne imagery in Revelation, you know. Um, and of course, like the Gospel of John and other things like that. Um, Blake, by the way, actually has a very good exegesis of First John 3, 1 to 3, in, uh, volume 3 of um, the Problems uh, of God and Gods, um, where he discusses, it's not merely about only sanctification or glorification a la presence, and it's a very strong Christification text as well. Just thought I'd yeah. it out there. And like one yeah. misunderstanding I often find by people who have, who sometimes hear your view but haven't actually read the chapter or anything like that is like, well, uh, they seem to think that you're denying that the Father became mortal and emptied himself and so forth. Yeah. I'm not sure if you ever heard that one before, but uh, some people who, whenever I've summarized your view or like someone else has summarized your views, like, well, that doesn't make sense because like the King Follow Discourse teaches that the father was mortal and so forth. But you're not denying that you would argue just as Christ was a pre-mortal uh, divine person who emptied himself, the idea of kenosis and was immortal in all things, except he never com engaged in sin. Um, it, it was a pretty uh, a parallel example with the father. He was a divine person, but he did actually generally uh, generally uh, empty himself and became immortal and so forth on a yeah exactly yeah the father did exactly what the son did this uh, just as the son was fully divine before becoming mortal he emptied himself became mortal the father was fully divine before becoming mortal he emptied himself became mortal and had power in himself to resurrect and he did so no I I, I don't under I, I heard that that understanding from my wife a few days ago saying, well, you believe that this, the father became mortal? It's like, well, yeah. <laughs> it, it's kind of like, you, how do you get that reading out of what I've said? But if that's a misunderstanding people have, I'm glad to clarify it. <laughs> yeah, like, um, again, like I kind of find this misunderstanding like amongst like very smart people who like, like you and your work, but like uh, maybe they just haven't read it like and it's kind of come out garbled. But like uh, maybe like one or two like other points as well you might uh, raise because I'm sure like uh, people who may not have read uh, volume two of uh, Exploring Mormon Todd or have like taught about this uh, topic seriously uh, until now might ask, well, um, Joseph's interpretation of Revelation chapter one, verse six, where he has the God the Father having a father. Now, the traditional view, if you will, would be that's the God the Father of God the Father. What's your understanding, though, of the Father of God the Father? Yeah, in the context of the sermons that he gives, he immediately after saying that God has a father, he says that um, the father became mortal, <laughs> okay? And he's explaining how it is that in his mortality, he has a father. Certainly, when the father became mortal, he had to have a father. And he's not referring to some kind of God who was his father or some person who was God before he was. He's referring to his, his experience as a mortal. Um, we even believe that Christ had a, had a father. And it may be that the, the father somehow was divinely begotten, but there's no indication, and I don't see any reason that has to be the case. It may be the case. But, um, you know, 
the father had a father as a mortal. And that's how, what I think the text is actually addressing. In fact, I think the text is very clear that's what it's addressing. Yeah, so uh, basically the short, uh, long and short of it is when Joseph's given his interpretation of Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, and he speaks of the father, the father's father, if you will. That father is the earthly father of God the Father when he experienced immortality or kenosis period. Not, well, too yeah, similar, that, not too dissimilar, maybe like say how Joseph was the father, albeit foster adopted father of Jesus uh, right. during mortality. Right. Well, and in fact, it's because he's, you know, he, he's explaining just as, as Christ had to have a father when he was mortal, the father had to have a father when he was mortal. Um, I think that it's pretty clear, though, that, that in Revelation, the, um, God has a father. He's, he's referring to Christ as God, <laughs> and he has a father because um, Christ is God and has been from all eternity except for and, and he was even god i mean we have we have the recognition that at the resurrection you know thomas refers to his him as my lord and my god uh, there's this this recognition only after he is exalted but he is claiming the divine name, name as a mortal according to the gospel of john and you know there's it, it'd be pretty hard to miss now we can argue how historical the Gospel of John is, but at least, you know, that's how the text presents it. Yeah, and of course, like, um, you're referring, of course, to, uh, for instance, to John eight fifty eight, where it says, before Abraham came into existence, ego, Amy, I am, you know, right. which is not just about, uh, not only like the divine name, but also in the Greek would suggest personal pre-existence, like a very high Christology in the Gospel of John. And also, uh, you have other texts as well, like uh, Hebrews, which, at least I would date pre-70, um, the very first chapter, uh, for instance, in verses 10 to 12, quotes from the Septuagint Psalm 102, which is right. an Old Testament Yahweh text, and applies it to the pre-mortal Jesus. So uh, that of all the texts, that's basically the dent knell to any Socinian or Arian Christology. It's a very high Christology already. And I would argue that the, the prologue of John does the same thing, where Christ is clearly the Word, and, he, the word, and it says expressly, the Word is God. <laughs> Yeah, and also, like, uh, the word is actually a person. It's not an abstract idea. Um, right. Because, like, right. I, I'm not sure if you know who Anthony Buzzard is, but, like, some Unitarians, like him and Dale Tuggy, have argued, well, the Logos does not actually become a person until verse 14. The Logos there is, like, the Old Testament, the bar. It's just, like, um, an attribute of God that becomes a person in Jesus, yeah. which is a, is a strange yeah. reading. I've, I've read the, the kind of Unitarian texts, and Del Tuggy in particular, and I don't find the arguments to be at all persuasive. So. Yeah. Um, to be fair, there are some Unitarians, maybe Christadelphians, who think, well, no, that's that's Jesus, the person, but it's about the new creation, which has problems as well, but at least they recognize it's a person view. Right, right. right. But that is what I'm referring to. I was referring to John 8, where, where Christ is using the divine name, and the Jews understand what he's saying, because they pick up stones to stone him for blasphemy. And they expressly say, you make yourself God. <laughs> so, you know, they know what's being claimed. It's not it's not hidden to them. And and the Gospel of John makes clear that it's not hidden to them. They want to kill him for it. Yeah, just, uh, I know this is a bit off topic, but, you know, discussing John, uh, but it's Christology and it's fun. Uh, like some would say, well, you know, the Jews often misunderstood Jesus. Like in John 6, they thought he wanted to be, uh, to literally eat his flesh and drink his blood. But at least when it comes to see what Jesus is presented as teaching about himself in the Gospel of John, it's not simply like a misunderstanding. It's actually a high Christology. Like in John 17, he claims personal pre-existence, and he also claimed to have a pre-mortal glory with the Father in verse 5 and a host of other things as well. So, um, right. And I also like John 18 when the uh, guards come to try to arrest Jesus. Like um, He basically says, ego, me, and they just fall down on the ground. Um, right. That's not simply like, say, a brave person stunning these guards. You know, it's... Uh, it, it kind of fits a better uh, Old Testament context of like the divine name and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So in any event, and, and to argue that Joseph Smith didn't believe that Christ was divine before his mortal birth is, in my opinion, ignoring virtually all of the evidence. And he even ignores the fact that Joseph Smith said on at least three occasions that the Holy Ghost would take upon himself a body and to argue that Joseph Smith didn't believe the Holy Ghost was divine. I mean, that's just, I'm sorry, that, that's stretching the evidence to a point that's not, it's just not scholarly responsible. It's not responsible in a scholarly way. Yeah, you, now you mentioned the Holy Ghost and like there's a common misunderstanding and it's pretty unfortunately common um, amongst many Latter-day Saints. Well, you have to have a physical body and you have to be resurrected to be God, you know. Right. Um, but 
I, I know you've addressed this. I, I know what the answer to this, but I'll just throw it over to you. Like, well, what about the Holy Spirit? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, well, and I also hear you have to be married in order to be God. And it's like, you know, you can argue that Jesus was married. I just don't see much evidence for that anywhere that's reliable. <laughs> Um, and I think it's fairly reliable. Where was his wife when he went on the cross? I mean, oh, it was Mary. Uh, no, it's not. Mary's clearly just a friend. So you don't have to be married to be exalted and, and deified. You don't have to have a body to be exalted and deified. What you do have to be is in unity with the Father. <laughs> um, that's, the, that's the condition of, of being deified. And then the others can add to our exaltation. Um, if we gain a body, we further progress. If we become married, we can further progress. If we have children, we can further progress. I will tell you that having children is a divine-like thing to do, but it's hard. And the reason it's a divine-like thing to do is we don't, we don't grow when we're in the comfort zone, and kids have a way of taking us out of the comfort zone over and over and over again. <laughs> and there's a lot of growth that comes through that. So, um, bottom line is is that the the gospel is laid out in such a way that we have opportunities to grow uh, some people won't have some opportunities they'll have other opportunities to grow so um but it, we can give all kinds of counter examples jesus was fully god before becoming mortal and he didn't have a body before becoming mortal either um he had a spirit and i guess you could argue well he had a spirit body and that's some a form of a body but I don't think that that's what people are arguing that God has to have a body or saying. <laughs> yeah, usually it's like, well, no, it has to be like a uh, resurrected, glorified body. But you do bring up a point like, uh, well, in our theology, there's no such thing as an immaterial spirit. So even like a pre-mortal spirit or the Holy Spirit as he is now, still he's like in some sense physical and actually does have a body in some sense. Right. So, right. But like the exact, again, going back to Christology. Uh, the very fact that the pre-mortal Jesus prior to the incarnation was God and not simply in the um, as a title but like in a real substantial sense if you will uh, a divine person um, would kind of refute the idea that you must have, be a resurrected person to be exalted or be divine or be God so yeah yeah but just like you could, because you mentioned like uh, maybe not to believe it or buy it, but like um, it seems like um, I'm neutral on the issue of like whether Jesus was married. I don't think uh, the New Testament is explicit one way or another. Um, and it seems like uh, maybe, I don't want to seem like I'm putting words in your mouth, like you seem like it, Jesus may not have been married at all. But do you believe like that means his exaltation is limited? Or uh, do you believe like he didn't have to be married? Um, what, what's your understanding, like say the exaltation of Jesus and marriage? And so well, like remember, exaltation is not like a game of golf where the maximum number you can get is 18. It, it's more like what is the largest planet that could exist? <laughs> well, that's infinite. <clears throat> so Jesus was, was fully divine before becoming mortal. He wasn't married. He didn't have a body. He was further exalted by becoming mortal and taking and being resurrected. He was super exalted according to Philippians. He can be further exalted if he takes upon him the kinds of things of being married. There are different ways, and they add exaltation in different ways. There's another way to look at it. For us, given where we are, we require marriage in order to become exalted. We're not already exalted, and to learn how to love in the way that God seeks to have us love, entering into a marital relationship and having children is essential to our progress. There, there may be something there we can't learn in any other way, okay? And that would be an exaltation that would be available to us because we require that experience. I'll be very explicit. I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all program here. I don't think everybody needs all the same experiences in order to be exalted. What will exalt you and where you are, given your progression, may be very different than where I am. So I'm not going to impose on you some set of requirements that you have to meet in order to be exalted. I can tell you that from my, from my own personal experience, being married has been an amazing experience. Having Being a father is the greatest thing I've ever done and probably the greatest thing I'll ever do. And I have grown immensely from it. Now, does everybody require that experience? How would I know? But I know how I've grown from it. <laughs> Oh, no, that's fine. Just like uh, because you mentioned the marital status of Jesus, I'm sure like some people listening in would like 
that to be asked. Uh, I didn't want to leave any in handing here, if you will. Yeah, no, I, I believe that. I also don't want to impose on people a set of requirements they have to meet, though. There are different ways of gaining experience um, that will be exalting for us. Yeah, and that kind of brings up like an entertain. I wasn't about to ask this, but I think this is a good thing. Um, what did the father actually benefit um, from by experiencing mortality? Like uh, in volume one of your work, you ex uh, discussed the concept of experiential knowledge for both the father and son experiencing mortality. So maybe if you were to like uh, uh, maybe expand briefly upon that, like um, on um, how experience, well, basically experiential knowledge can be received through experience, you know. Um, sure. Well, let me say, you know, we have this, this statement in DNC 121 that all these things shall give us experience and shall be for our good. I think that experience is inherently valuable. And I have to assume that before we got here, we've had an eternity of experiences, but there's no limit to the kinds of experiences we can have. And there are a certain type of knowledge that there's only one way to get, and that's through experiencing it directly. You can tell me all you want about what it's like to be in Ireland, but I've never been there. And I don't know what it's like, even after you tell me all about it. Well, hopefully someday you will, so I'll show you around. Oh, no, it's on my bucket list. Trust me, Ireland and the Emerald Isles are definitely on my on my list, and, and not too far in the future either. But, um, you know, I, I'm just going to say that the, the bottom line is that these kinds of experiences give us a kind of knowledge that can't be gained in any other way. It's very valuable knowledge. It's the kind of knowledge that gives us a deeper compassion and understanding than we could have just through some kind of third-hand experience. Now, I'm going to qualify that just a bit. God participates, in my view, he participates immediately in all of our experiences because our experience is included within his experience. But God's experience of our experience is not quite the same as our experience. So assume with me, I walk into a bank, and shortly after I walk into a bank, some guy walks in, pulls out a gun, and says, everybody on the floor, I'm robbing this place, and if you move, I'm going to blow your head off. I have a lot of fear, or at least that would be natural for me to be afraid. God knows that I'm afraid, but God's not fearing for his life the way I am. Okay. His life's not in danger. And so even though he has my, you know, he participates in my experience, he doesn't have my experience. It's experience from a third person perspective, not a direct first person experience. And the nature and tenor of that experience are very different. So there's only one way to gain this first person experiential knowledge, and that is through experiencing it directly. Thus, all divine beings have a motive for becoming mortal, and that is to gain experience by becoming mortal. No, that's fine. And um, Blake actually has a very good discussion about this in the final two chapters of volume one, where he deals with Christology and how can the divine person learn something through experiential knowledge and other issues as well, uh, which, is very well done. It's one of the better discussions, actually probably the best discussion on the two natures doctrine from a Latter-day Saint perspective, the hypostatic union and its multitudinous problems and like uh, many other issues as well. So um, that's, everyone should check that out. Um, but um, yeah, um, I think we kind of covered like a lot of the um, common misunderstandings of your perspective and the criticisms in the uh, dialogue piece. But um, do you have any other things you would like to add before we uh, end things? No, other than that, um... This is a very important discussion. Whether God has been God from all eternity makes a big difference. As I said, I suspect the Pankratz is looking for some kind of a wedge that he can use against LDS by saying, look how wildly different their view is than what the Bible teaches. Because the Bible doesn't teach that God um, you know, became God at some first moment. It teaches that God has eternally been God. But no Christian could possibly argue against the view that God could become a human being because they believe that God did become a human being. <laughs> and what is amazing to me is that even people who argue that the Father and the Son are identical, and even the same being in some sense, want to argue that the Father could never possibly have a, a body, could possibly have a mortal experience. But Jesus could. And that Jesus, even though he's very God, is very different from the very God they believe in. Jesus is the counterexample to everything they assert, assert about God. Um, and that's amazing to me for a tradition where the finest minds in its tradition and history have expended incredible resources in trying to make sense of the phrase that God became man, or that, that God was fully human and fully divine at the same time, which is, you know, what what their ecumenical councils teach.
Yeah, Abbott's in Kelsville. Yeah. Yeah, in Calcedon and a number of other councils, actually. So the bottom line is that I believe, look, I'm a believer. I am, I, I remain very devoted and I have a great deal of loyalty to the teachings of Joseph Smith. And therefore, I'm a, you know, I seek to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I bring to this a believer's experience. And um, I think that the, what Joseph Smith taught is so exalted and enlightening, so incredibly filled with the spirit that I move by it. And, uh, you know, people like Pankratz want, you know, don't want people to see that. <laughs> and I suspect that's why he mangled the evidence the way he did. Yeah, no, thanks for saying that. Like, as with you, like, I do find Joseph's theology, like, section 93, which is a personal favorite of mine, I think it's also a personal favorite of yours, like, yeah. so groundbreaking and moving. It's so early as well. It's only like early 1833. And then you read Joseph's theology as a whole, you know, and how it's much more consistent. Than many people even give it credit for, you know, it's, it's a really moving theology. But like, yeah. I, remember like saying, I think that it's all there in section um 93 before you get to the Nauvoo stuff so <laughs> yeah because um it does kind of show like a so-called Nauvoo theology like you have at the very least the seeds if not the explication of many of these so-called aspects of Nauvoo theology like creation from pre-existing material personal pre-existence of everyone not just Jesus um the belief that there's numerically one uh, more than one person who's God in the real sense you know um, and so on and so forth. Like, um, yeah, like what you find in the Kinfall of Discourse and so-called Nauvoo theology, maybe like putting, uh, explicitly teaching a lot of these things, but you do have them clearly articulated in varying degrees. Pre right. 1844. Well, let me make it even clearer. You've got DNC 93 that is given in 1833. The lectures on faith in 1835, the fifth lecture, which I think is probably the only one that could have a claim to actually being written in part by Joseph Smith. And the seventh lecture are basically um, summarizing DNC 93 and Mosiah 15. And the King Follett Discourse is actually picking up on the fifth and seventh lectures on faith as, as a basis that he's elucidating. Joseph Smith has learned a little bit about Hebrew in the meantime, and he's elucidating. He's learned a lot by Joseph Smith's mind was very feckin. I mean, undoubtedly, his Hebrew teacher, Sizes, has taught him about, you know, the word Elohim, and Joseph Smith starts to have all kinds of breakthroughs about there's more than one God. <laughs> there's a council of gods. And he begins to understand an ancient, a genuinely ancient Hebrew view. In my third volume, I show how the, the Hebrew worldview of the council of the gods, you know, let over, that is um, presided over by the god El, the father god, is, is the precursor and the basis for what we find in the Hebrew view of God. And, and how the Hebrew view of God develops from that basis. And there's no question that there is a council of gods found throughout the Old Testament, even in the most, in what some people believe are the most intensely monotheistic passages, Isaiah 40 through, through 66, right? Even there, there, there are references to the council of gods. <clears throat> and so yeah, what we... And, you know, you have to know what you're looking for to find them. You need to know what an antiphonal response of the council is, and that kind of thing. But they're, they're definitely there. And so Joseph Smith has this incredible insight into to the Hebrew Council of Gods and what the Old Testament is teaching and what the New Testament continued, the background for what the New Testament is actually saying. And frankly, I think that evangelicals are very threatened by that. Now, Michael Heiser is an evangelical. He's not threatened by it. He teaches it all the time. But when I, I mean, when I read evangelicals, it's very clear to me that, that they want to avoid the notion that, that there's a genuine council of gods at all costs. <laughs> Their theology requires it. And here's why. If you believe that God is an unmoved mover, he created everything and everything else is created. There can only be one God because there's only one cre uncreated being in the universe and could possibly logically only be one there couldn't possibly be another like god because there's this ontological distinction between created and uncreated their theology demands this intense metaphysical monotheism it just won't fit the bible the sons of god and, and by calling them the sons of god if saying that they're the sons of god doesn't tell you that they're the same genesis species as god is 
the same type of being ontologically, nothing could possibly convey the, the idea because they're not giving us theologically precise types of definitions. And so there's nothing that is clear in the Old Testament than they see the gods as on a continuum with, with um, the head god. And, and that is precisely, that's a good way to put it. He's the head god. He's, he's, he's the one who's over all of the gods and over the council of the gods. And he, um, from all eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost have been in this united relationship of love, and they've invited us into it. That's the Christian message. And it's, and it's an amazing message. It's a message of love and, and inclusivity um, that, that isn't based upon a notion of racism. It's, it's much broader than that kind of inclusivity. <laughs> okay. So that, that's my summer. That's my summarizing statement. I'm an attorney. So I always give closing statements. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, it's just like, uh, yeah, you're uh, right. Even in like purportedly strict uh, monotheistic texts like Isaiah, there's clearly the council of gods, like in Isaiah six and even like 40 to 48, um, it's there like but even in deuteronomy for instance like there's the dead sea scrolls text of deuteronomy 32 7 to 9 and 43 that was discovered a few decades ago at Qumran as um not the sons of adam or sons of man but the sons of god you know and um they have their they have a real existence they're not idols and um you know they're deities but under a singular head god if you will so it's something that permeates like the original language text of the bible even like passages like 1 Corinthians 8, 4 to 6, where there's one God, which is numerically one person, the Father, and one Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not speaking of Shema, it's an expansion of the Shema. Again, contra right. And like, I'm sure like someone will, you know, when they're listening to you mention Heiser, I'm sure like the response will be, well, Heiser disagrees with LDS. It's like, yes, but uh, I think the main point of argue, uh, point of dissent, uh, distinction between Heiser's view and our view ultimately is the idea like species uniqueness of Yahweh. And you deal with that on pages 280 to 288 of volume three of your book, um, right. where you discuss like Nehemiah 9, 6 and other passages where um, you show like Yahweh is not um, uh, sea generous in terms of uh, species uniqueness that he argues, right. at least against uh, the LDS reading of Psalm 82 and John 10. So I just thought I'd throw it out there, but like, overall, overall, like Heisey work in the Divine Council is actually really, really good. So. Yeah, no, it's good stuff. He really doesn't have a very good argument for why the gods are a different species than God the, the, the the head god um, and, so, um, and as i said he but i respect his work he's he's going against the grain of what evangelicals want to hear he, i think he's laid a lot on the line for it so i have a lot of respect for that yeah and overall like he's uh, material is good and like his doctorate dissertation is like full of very interesting things as well and, like most of his stuff's free online so if someone wants to delve right. into the divine council it's there he has also done a very good job at refuting the nonsense about the bible code that comes up every so often you know uh, uh, agreed yeah. Well, um, well, we could discuss like Christology and other topics like uh, until the cows come home, as we say here. But um, Blake, um, again, I do appreciate you coming on to discuss this. Um, hopefully people who um, will listen to this will actually check out your material on the King Fuller Discourse and Sermon in the Grove, uh, including the podcast I'll link to from the Exploring Mormon Talk podcast. And also, of course, you know, go back to the sources and read the different accounts of the King Fuller Discourse and Sermon in the Grove and make their own decision here. But it does show like uh, the reading that you propose uh, has much more plausibility exegetically, theologically, and in terms of consistency than some people um, believe it to have, you know, uh, right. both good faith actors and uh, not so good faith actors, shall we say. But um, and, and just as one parting comment, I join you in mourning what has happened to dialogue. Um, it's a sad thing to see. Um, hopefully sometime in the future, it will, it will relinquish control from the present editor and we'll get something different. Well, here's hoping. Um, but until then, uh, interpreter uh, and other uh, journals are actually still good. And because I'm, bi I'm biased a little bit, but uh, mormonor.org for very good primary source information as well. So, um, but Blake, uh, as I said, I'll link to your stuff here, like including the Greg Covert books for your books. Everyone should check them out. They're excellent resources as well as a few other articles. Um, I'll also include one I've written defending divine embodiment against uh, Lynn Wilder, where I go through like John 424 and other texts as well. Um, because oh, you did a good job. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, before we end, are you working on any other projects? Will it be like another volume in the Exploring the Mormon Taught series or is there anything else you're working on at the moment? Uh, I've, I've got two volumes that I'm working on. One is on spiritual knowledge. You could call it spiritual epistemology. 
but it's really about um, spiritual knowledge. And then I'm working on a fifth volume on the mind body problem and what we, the, the problems that arise from asserting that an embodied being like us could survive death and that our minds could survive brain death. And more importantly, how are we free if everything we do is merely the result of collocation of, of chemicals in our brains, that kind of a thing. So it's, I think, you know, I've been working on the fifth volume my entire life. Um, it's really what got me into philosophy. It was the first question I asked, how can I possibly be free if everything I do is controlled by the chemicals in my brain over which I have no control? And so, you know, obviously I don't believe that's the case. Um, I've been explaining how that is and how we can survive death um, when our, our it's very clear that in very important respects, our the ability to have consciousness in this world is dependent on our brain. So discussing all of that and explaining it is, is a fairly important, but it's a big project. So, Well, uh, there are both volumes I think like um, Elias will benefit from because um you've written on topics where like, I'm glad you've written on them, but like before you've written books on these topics, there've been a, uh, a lack of resources, a Christology or the plurality of gods or soteriology. So um, uh, there's a good need for like works on spiritual epistemology and stuff like that. So um, looking forward to those volumes and hopefully um, um, we can have you, have you on again, maybe to discuss them when they come out or what have you. But um, until then, like I do greatly appreciate your time and everything you've done and everything you continue to do. And um well, hopefully we can actually have you on again in the podcast and not to you uh, just in the future. But uh, again, I appreciate your time and hopefully this has been informative for those who are going to listen to this podcast episode. Thanks, Bob. I appreciate your kindness. Thanks for having me on. And you know, it, hopefully this will be helpful for some folks. Well, uh, for those listening, uh, hopefully we will have a few more episodes in October. I hope to have Nathaniel Givens on to discuss the topic of abortion. So I'm preparing to be cancelled for that particular topic. And hopefully have Carl Cranny on in the near future to discuss his doctoral dissertation as well, as well as other uh, episodes in the uh, pipeline, shall we say. But until then, um, God bless and thank you for uh, listening.